Hi everyone, <laughs> welcome to another, well actually to the last collateral onboarding call of the year 2020. Uh, in this case, real world assets. Um, yeah, we're very, very excited about everything that happened in this last couple of months. And uh, Seb is going to be speaking a little bit more about that. And then after that, we're going to have um, a quick uh, presentation by, well, I guess introduction by Leah from Centrifuge. And then we're going to have three asset originators uh, talking about the product, Harbor Trade Credit, People's Company, and Fortunify. Uh, again, a very, very informal conversation. So if anyone feels like, uh, like interrupting or asking a call, please go ahead. Um, and yeah, Seb, if you want to, to take it away. Yeah, sure. So I want to thank thanks everyone uh, for joining this call. As it's as you have said, it's the last one for the year. So we've made uh, some good progress on real world asset, uh, all the maker teams. Uh, so currently, I was maybe I can just share it quickly. So yeah, this is just a quick uh, status of every real world assets we currently we are currently onboarding. So for success, uh, Matthew is doing a lot of work on inside registering a Cayman Island entity currently. Uh, we are still working, uh, waiting on the smart contract and Oracle the work, uh, but that should be quick, just a smart contract at the end as uh, Matthew has provided most of the smart contract code. For new silver, uh, almost everything is green. Uh, we are still waiting for the Oracle assessment, but uh, it shouldn't be an issue and it should be quick. And same as the smart contract and Oracle works, but it's just a formality as Centrifuge has done most of the contract work. And Consult Right is uh, just exactly the same story waiting for the same Oracle assessment and the smart contracts work. Uh, so I think that uh, we should have a launch date for all real world assets in January, let's say in January. And uh, that's a super, a super good news that everything is good moving forward. And uh, I think there's also, uh, sorry, so I wanted to ask you, I think there's uh, an implementation side that would have to I guess be added here, right? Uh, what kind of implementations, implementation side? Yeah, are you so speaking? I mean, once that the assess, once that the assessments are are made, you still need to implement, right? Uh, yes, but for the smart contract teams, that should be quite easy because it's MIP twenty one and MIP twenty two. Uh, most of the code is done. They are testing in Covan, and they will put in production uh, next year. So I don't expect too much delay here. And on the smart contract team, we are uh, sorry, on the risk team, we are working on the infrastructure to monitor all the loans that, that will be made uh, by the special uh, purpose vehicles. But we can start uh, as soon as possible. Good. Are there any questions for Seb regarding this? All right, Leah, if you want to. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I guess this this call is a little bit of a, because it's the last collateral um, onboarding call of the year, at least for real world assets. I think we wanted to use it as a little bit of recap what happened 2020, but then also give an outlook on what we'll be working on um, next year. And I think um, Sebastian was a little bit shy in like talking about what, um, how much work actually his team has put into formalizing the process of real world assets. Maybe just like recap on our side, we have been working with Maker. Um, I see Greg is on the call. Like we have been working with Maker for I think almost two years now. And but like really this year, real world assets has gotten a major push um, within the community, and um, it has been yeah, really great to be able to um, get to the point where we are right now. Um, I guess what I want to point out um, 
is that we are at Sunny Food, what we've been working on, or like where we see us, we see us as the technology provider. So we have been building the tools that all the different asset originators that are here on the call, but that also have gone through the process already, um, can make use of to basically securitize um, pool of loans. So like take the different real world assets, bring them on chain and then um, create fungible ERC-20 tokens to then use those in, in Maker. And we have also come a long way. We've been working on our protocol throughout the year. We've launched our V3. Um, we've launched and audited our version three end of October. As of today, we have six pools live with the six different asset originators. And um, here the, um, the assessments or like the process that Seb showed is we have been um, particularly working with two asset originators or with two of our partners to basically guide them or support them through the governance process that has been really new for everyone here. Um, risk, risk evaluation is out um, and um, smart contracts is also in the works and oracles coming soon. Um, and so these are the, the two um, that are on the almost at the finishing line um, of this process. And I guess what we wanted to what we wanted to do today is give a little bit of an outlook. Um, what we have in our pipeline, we really, we're really working towards having real world assets play a big part of DeFi 21 and not, I mean, and having Maker as one of the cornerstones of DeFi, of course, working towards um, onboarding more real world assets um, onto the system. And we have asked three of our partners or asset originators that we're working with already to jump on a call today. And um, they are at, they're, they're very different in the collateral type that they finance. We'll, Get, we'll get an overview of that in just a second. And then also um, the stage where they're in um, with the governance process. So we have um, we have on one end, we have Throttle and Harvard Trade Credit that are working on a pool to finance trade finance transactions. They've launched the Series 2. They will launch the Series 2 actually tomorrow. Um, they have already submitted their MIP6 um, a couple of months ago. They passed the green light stage. Um, and then um, we have People's Company that just submitted their um, MIP6 last week um, as a company that's working on tokenizing farmland and um, yeah, waiting for the community green light. And then last, we have Nick from Fortunify, um, who's planning on entering the governance cycle in January and submitting his MIP6 then. And he will be introducing revenue-based finance. So all like very different diverse assets. And um, each of them will, so we're many on this call and it will um, more or less only be an introduction to these assets. I think we won't have time to go into so much depth. So we thought 10 minutes each presenting and then five minutes Q and A, um, we can play it by ear. So feel free to um, ask questions in the chat or we'll pick it up later. Um, I think we'll, we'll figure it out along the way. And I don't even wanna be, um, spend so much time talking. Maybe we'll just start with Throttle and Harbitry Credit. And I think you prepared a few slides. Um, let, let me know if you can share your screen. Yeah, that. So I'll go ahead uh, and share. It looks like I'm sharing my screen. Can everyone see it? Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks again for having us. Uh, I am uh, with the Throttle Capital side of the team here, and uh, as Leah had mentioned, you know we 
We're working on the initial transaction with Harbor Trade Credit, uh, closed that, and now uh, literally this week, uh, working on the, the second transaction, which will be a revolving pool. Um, <clears throat> you know, what, what we have uh, done so far, uh, just to kind of give you an update on, on who we are and how we fold into it, uh, I'll start with our team at Throttle Capital. And we essentially have been uh, in the industry for uh, quite a bit. And so uh, my partner, Rana, who I'll introduce in a, in a moment, uh, is uh, our structured finance guru. He's been at kind of all the, the Wall Street shops that you see here on the page, you know, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, Morgan Stanley, and uh, Funding Circle. I was uh, also kind of in the, uh, started in the credit world, uh, both with mortgage, uh, banking, investments, a little bit of insurance. And then in 2010 was in an early employee at Lending Club, uh, had a great run there. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, worked at a hedge fund and then worked at a online venture capital firm where I got really excited uh, about cryptocurrency. Uh, the company I was at was called Funder, Funders Club. Uh, we were actually one of the first investors in Coinbase, uh, Chain Analysis, uh, Shapeshift, and, and about a dozen um, crypto platforms or exchanges. Uh, so since then, I've been a personal investor, both on the equity side as well as individually. Pretty excited to see Bitcoin go over 20,000 today. Um, so it, it's been an exciting year for, for crypto, I think, just in general for all of us. And DeFi for me has been kind of a passion and, and really enjoyed learning about it so far and, and getting a little bit deeper dive. Uh, we do have a technology advisor and our data and analytics guys that are very well experienced, both with Wall Street as well as uh, internally, as you'll see here, Rob Kram over at Facebook, Funding Circle and, and so on. Um, we're gonna pass this over briefly to Rana Mukherjee, my partner. He can kind of give you a, an overview of, of what we look at uh, traditionally uh, outside of the DeFi community and how we're going to bring this to real world assets on the DeFi chain. Rana? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah. So what we focus on is really cash flow, uh, uh, cash flowing assets. Um, we look at it's the private uh, structured finance market in the real world side. Uh, we're focused on shorter term assets uh, and with higher yields and have uh, uh, kind of statistical cash flows. Uh, we like this asset because it, it is uh, uh, at some level, uh, it can be structured to be very uh, safe uh, for lending against them. We typically segregate assets in an SPV uh, and lend against those assets at some level and uh, generate uh, high, higher yields uh, than um, other comparable uh, assets. And the, what we like about this is it can be, there can be triggers uh, on the underlying collateral uh, to, there could be reserve accounts there. It can be structured in num numerous different ways to protect against different types of risk. And it can scale with the underlying originators. And well, if you look at this list of the assets that we work with, uh, they're all data driven. They are uh, they kind of take lending the new uh, new vistas in how they look at risk. They're not just relying on FICO scores, and um, and these are Y Combinator technology companies in Silicon Valley with tremendous sponsorship from blue chip real world VCs. So. We, they don't, they understand scale, they understand technology. Few of these uh, founders understand debt. And that's where Blake and I kind of come in uh, and we are kind of their capital markets arm uh, to bring them to uh, institutional capital. And we're excited to bring them to the DeFi community. Uh, and that's uh, kind of our focus uh, on this channel. I'll hand it over to Blake. Or Brian, I guess. Actually, uh, yeah, uh, Brian uh, at Harbor Trade, uh, you're on mute now, but uh, this is uh, your part here. So we'll go ahead and pass it over to Brian. Thanks, guys. 
Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for the time. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll, I'll start with um, a little intro on uh, on what what trade credit is, right? And and what Harbor is providing to clients. So, you know, in in in, tr in trade finance, this this big realm and umbrella of, of of trade finance. There's a lot of avenues, and I think we're sort of narrowly focused on. Um, supply chain finance, which is a, a buyer-led initiative to uh, improve working capital and liquidity, uh, with a with a focus upstream on on procurement on on payables, right? So you know, as an as an asset originator, we originate trade receivables, which are you know payment obligations, but there there's an anchor buyer, right? So typically, you have uh, like our client focus is you know. US, European, middle market corporates that have some senior secured uh, credit facilities that are taking care of the, the current assets on the balance sheet, right? So they're accelerating receivables, uh, they're pledging inventory to, to borrow against, um, but that's only sort of one, one piece of the puzzle or one side of the equation when looking at a cash conversion cycle of the business, right? So where we come in is we really work to optimize the payables. And so what we're doing here is we're playing a supplier aggregation role where we are, we're offering payments to suppliers upon shipment and delivery, and then transforming tenors of those payables down to you know, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, whatever it may be, right? Um, if you want, if you want to, uh, Blake, if you want to jump to the other slide there, client focus. Yeah, so so this is kind of where we play, right? So proactively originating in, in North America, um, really what comes with that along the way throughout our origination um, is we see a lot of opportunities in, in Europe, and now we're seeing a lot more in, in Latin America. So the profile is really this 10 to 200 million. We've even got some larger mandates um, looking at some uh, larger, but still mid-market corporates as we would call it. And uh, aggregate credit limits of under a million, 250, 500,000 up to you know, 3 million or $4 million. Um, <clears throat> we're industry agnostic. Um, we're working with commodities traders. We're working with manufacturers. Um, working with some retail outlets and distributors across all industry segments. Um, so that, on the next slide, getting back to what I was saying about cash conversion cycle, right? Like why, why, why do companies need supply chain finance, right? So you see here, this cash conversion cycle is a, a formula uh, that consists of you know, receivables, inventory, uh, and then and then payables, right? So it really defines or calculates what the working capital need is for a business, right? Um, how quickly are they collecting on receivables? How quickly is the inventory turning? And can they turn the inventory and sell it before they have to pay for it, right? So where we're really focused is on, op again, optimizing the payables. So this is a typical as-is scenario where we'll have our, a client, uh, they've got an asset-based facility, covering inventory and receivables, that 60 day carrying costs on inventory, the 90 day collection. So accelerating receivable, monetizing the inventory that's on the balance sheet, right? So that's the as is, so you have, you know, basically you have 150 days working capital need because there's a payment at site, there's no payables. Now this is an extreme example, uh, but if you go to the next slide, what, what we're doing here is reducing that working capital need down to 30 days, right? So you have inventory still sitting at 60 days, receivables still collecting in 90 days. But if you're optimizing the payables, basically selling it before you have to pay for it, you're creating liquidity and working capital efficiency, right? Um, so that's sort of the nuts and bolts of our structure. Now, now what we do is from an asset origination standpoint is since we take the role of the supplier as a supplier aggregator, right? We now have trade receivables and a payment obligation that we then assign into our vehicle, into our fund, right? And so those are the underlying assets sitting on the balance sheet of, of the vehicle in which in, investors like yourself and, and, the, and the DeFi community 
can can uh, lend against uh, and, and have that collateral. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the nuts and bolts. Um, there's a lot of detail that goes into this, <laughs> a lot of information that, that I'd be happy to share offline. Uh, but I thought that it'd be best to just give you sort of a high level of the asset class and the solution that we're providing. Well, thanks. Are there any questions? Um, maybe yeah, you I can. Oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say it's a pretty straightforward uh, solution uh, in trade finance. So I guess that's why there are not a lot of of questions. Um, maybe you can just share a little bit on um, maybe what um, what pool size you're working on and um, what you intend to um, originate in the next six or twelve months. Or just like how, what your plans are to grow it? Is that for me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. So this, so the second pool we're bringing back in, um, an existing client, Snakebite, um, which is a consumer electronics business focused on um, aftermarket video game accessories, um, and they've also expanded into other segments like um, uh, flight simulation yokes, um, as well as uh, tablets. They're a uh, Disney licensed. Um, they have a license from Disney uh, and they're making this proprietary tablet uh, for, for kids, which is like Frozen and, and Toy Story 4 and all, all of that stuff. So it's like kind of cool products coming out. So we're certainly um, excited to expand the program with, with Snakebite. Um, the performance has been good. Um, we see a growth trajectory there. So we're, we're looking forward to expand upon that. Um, we, uh, like I said, we are very industry agnostic. So we have, we have deals in, in the pipeline that we'll be introducing to this vehicle um, over the next um, six to 12 months. Um, where we're focused now is given the current environment and considering COVID, um, we're looking at very sort of neutral type segments of, of the market. So introducing programs like uh, home, you know, ga gaming as an example, right? Or, um, or staples like some, some food, we're looking at some coffee opportunities um, in Europe and, and in the US. Um, so that's kind of, been, will be the client focus going forward over the next 12 months, um, considering, you know, some of the, the counterparty risks that may exist with consumer spending and uh, 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 industries, I suppose, that are uh, a little bit exposed to COVID and a downturn. Um, our expectation over the next 12 months conservatively is about 25 million in origination, um, uh, of which I expect probably anywhere from five to seven to be introduced uh, through the 10 light protocol. Well, thanks. Um, I think Will wrote something here. Yeah. Um, um, can you introduce a bit where they fit and how they interact with the actors of the value chain, freight carriers, customs, etc.? You can also see the question here in the chat, um, Brian. I guess oh, it's I question for you. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's probably also a question for you. Yeah, so um, as, a, as a trade finance company, um, we're certainly reliant on um, the, the carriers, um, specifically as it relates to verification of the underlying trading activity, right? Um, so <clears throat> when we're funding transactions, we, we use uh, bills of lading for verification. Um, we are not integrated nor involved with the movement of goods or integrated with the uh, service providers, logistics uh, providers uh, that are actually moving goods like freight forwarders um, as, as of today. Of course, we have different ideas on, on, the, on the horizon, um, but, but we're not integrated currently. 
I hope that answers the question or maybe there's a different direction there. Yeah, or maybe we can also then um, continue that conversation at a later point and maybe move on, oh, like, or we'll just let us know. And then maybe let's move on to the next one um, to people's company in case there are no more questions. I actually have a quick question. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just curious, so maybe this is more of a tin like question, but where do you demonstrate your underwriting standards and how can the maker holders keep track of that? Is that a tin like question? I don't know. <laughs> maybe that's a question for Blake and Rana and, or maybe Jason, you can also chime in. Yeah, the, the, the focus here is to really look at the underlying counterparty risk uh, on these transactions and diversify counterparties and receivables on the other end. And, um, and that diversification uh, creates um, the, 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 uh, the safety, if you will, in, in the deal. So in the case of Snakebite, we looked at the underlying financials. We looked at uh, the, the trajectory of the sales going forward on the underlying products and the demand uh, for that product. And, it, we, and we thought it was a good test pilot solution for, for this channel. Um, on the throttle side, uh, our, uh, we plan to introduce uh, traditional structured finance transactions that have $1,000 loans adding up to several million dollars and then have uh, an A and a B piece um, and in the drop in tin structure that, that's contemplated here. And those are, uh, we underwrite those levels uh, based on uh, the underlying cash flows. And, and yeah, I, think that, I think the difference here, what Ron is pointing out is depending on the asset class, right? So, so we're, we're, we're underwriting credit risk um, as you know, some, of the, some of the other activity that throttles involved, with, that's a portfolio analysis, right? That's, that's the difference. Um, we're buyer led supply chain finance. The obligor is, is corporate, right? Um, so it's about credit risk and debt service of the individual obligor. And of course, you know, the, as it scales, um, there's a pool performance that, that, that'll be looked at, but on, on an individual basis, we're assess assessing credit risk and, and debt service. Yeah, so, so I guess my question is, what level of visibility will the maker holders have into that through TinLake? So can we click on an individual loan and see all the details that you just described to me? As far as financials on the, on the individual obligors? No, but that, you know, kind of a checkbox that you did that for that borrower and what, your out, what the outcome was? So you're, but are you talking about like an explicit scoring model? That, that we would that we would use on a particular client. Yeah, I'm really asking broadly, like as a maker holder, what do I see when I click into your loan portfolio? Is it a black box? Do I just see that I'm lending you money or do I see details of each loan? It's, it's the pool performance as of today. Yeah, maybe I can- uh, Being I can on, the, in. on the risk side. Yeah, uh, so on the TINEC page, you can see the, every loan that were made, uh, but you don't have access to the credit score of the company or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the risk side, uh, we can have access to those informations and we maintain another spreadsheet uh, to, to follow the credit quality of the portfolio. And we can do some due diligence we make a due diligence on the due diligence of the asset originator. And then we can, uh, using sampling techniques, see if everything uh, is okay with, uh, with the credit limit at least. Got it. And do we have like an approval mechanism for new loans entering the pool? Like how do we know that a you know, horribly rated company is not gonna be pushed into the pool? Like what's the, the blocker mechanism there? Uh, there is no blocker mechanism. It's, it's after the fact, mainly because for most assets on the centrifuge up to, to now, the loans are quite small and you don't want to, to take time. It's every time to review the loan. 
you do that every month or every quarter, depending on the type of, uh, of asset. Uh, for, for instance, for new silver, uh, it will be uh, quarterly. And for uh, some, uh, consult right, it will be monthly because uh, the loans are short, not really. I, it's I easier also, to, to get to access to data. I would also mention that as an asset originator, um, we uh, have taken a junior position in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. so, Oh yeah, I know. I'm, I'm not doubting that you guys are very incentivized not to do that. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to understand mechanically, like what the flow is going to look like from the, uh, the maker holders perspective. Yeah, but we will not be able to share more information. I think on the public side because you cannot say that uh, one corporate is as bad financials if it's under an NDA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to take up all the time. But but thank yeah, you. Maybe maybe one question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, um, uh, to 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 address Greg, your your, your question is uh, the tin and the drop pricing already show you actually what the performance of the pool would look like. And if you not just track and trace the the drop price, but also how how the tin tranche is performing, you really see if the pool is actually on target or not. Because you know the tin had to out has to outbeat uh, the, the drop token to be you know kind of developing in the right way and uh, kind of uh, uh, make this thing working for the for the tin investors um, so uh, and if you see that the, the drop price is falling below uh, uh, that the tin price is falling below the drop price that it already shows you hey there is something wrong with the pool and then you should really dive into uh, the nfts which are in the pool uh, may also reach out to the asset originator hey what's going on with those nfts underperforming that the payment is delayed etc and that is all on chain you know you can really track and trace the single assets you see how they perform what you do not see is of course what is behind the assets that is a private information uh, um, uh, 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 Blake has uh, Brian has mentioned here and Blake uh, because of course they do not want to reveal those business secrets like hey what is uh, my business counterparty what are the details on the invoice what is unit prices for example you know so uh, yeah. that is that's not on chain that's not visible but uh, that it's I think on request especially then for 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 maker uh, uh, the, the, the risk assessment team, SEP and co, and, and, and Phil, they most likely would have access to the data and can check that on, on your behalf. Yeah, that answers my question. Martin, how, how, how often, Martin, are the, the prices updated? Uh, we call it epoch and that is typically happening on a daily basis uh, there is a lot of demand for redemptions investments that can happen more often so the nav of the, the token price drop in tin is typically updated on a daily basis okay cool then i'll chime in here and um maybe give the word to people's company to mark and see okay i take it that's my cue Hello, everybody. Uh, Mark Moore uh, with People's Company. And thanks very much for uh, participating and your interest in our MIP6 application to uh, bring farmland, US farmland, onto the, uh, the MakerDAO platform. Um, we have not much time. Just a couple of things we want to accomplish today. Uh, first, a brief introduction to People's Company. And then, secondly, uh, an introduction to farmland as an investment asset class and some of the characteristics of it and what we find appealing about it. Um, as you all know, the, uh, the application is to acquire US farmland and to finance that with uh, you know, the MakerDAO uh, platform facility and uh, to bring you know, farmland to, to the platform as a, a truly a real, a real asset. And uh, the, uh, the, the goal is to, the, the intent is to buy you know, high quality US you know, row crop farmland in the heart of US Corn Belt. So focused around Iowa and the surrounding states where strong soil and water availability come together in combination to create you know, very stable farmlands uh, from an asset value perspective and operational perspective and land that can be relatively easily leased to farm operators who will operate it and, and make lease payments. Um, so that, that's the basic strategy. Um, People's company has a lot of experience in that just to give you background on people's. Peoples is a company whose uh, roots go back to the 1960s. Uh, the legacy business involves all around farmland, involves farmland appraisal, farmland brokerage and sales, uh, farmland management on behalf of uh, third party owners. And more recently, in the past several years, we've gotten involved in uh, investment management, you know, where we work with um, investors such as family offices and institutional investors to build portfolios of farmland that they want to own long-term, 
short term depending on their objectives. So we help devise and implement and manage those strategies. And we also work with people's clients, people's company clients um, to finance uh, their acquisitions or refinance their farmland assets uh, with a network of banks and non-bank lenders that we work with. Uh, in total, uh, People's company uh, each year, or I say over the past five years, has handled about uh, $1 billion worth of uh, land sales, another $1 billion worth of land appraisals, and we manage upwards of 50,000 acres of farmland on behalf of third party owners and investors. Those 50,000 acres have a value of approximately half a billion dollars. Uh, so, as part of that land management, we work with a bench of uh, farm operators. So individual farmers, family farmers, large, more professional farming groups uh, to farm that land uh, and manage the leases, manage the, uh, the, the, the process around uh, owning the farm. So quite extensive network of farmers that we work with and have uh, the ability to pull in farmers to, um, to lease land, uh, to renew leases, to, to find new lessees. So quite an extensive reach there. Um, that's the, you know, People's Company is based in Iowa. Um, it's, uh, it, it covers 26 states, uh, all the key agricultural regions of the U.S. Uh, from the heart of the, heart of the Midwest around Iowa, the upper Midwest and the Dakotas, South and North Dakota, down to the Delta region in Arkansas, um, Missouri, and up to the Pacific Northwest in Oregon and California. So uh, cover all crops. Um, and crop varieties and crop systems. So quite extensive knowledge when it comes to different production systems. Um, with that, I'd like to you know, be able to get into some of the characteristics of farmland investments. Uh, I won't be doing that, but a colleague of mine will. And uh, just to introduce you to a couple of other people, a few other people on the, on the presentation here uh, who are available for questions. Um, first of all, we have Dave Muth, uh, who's here. He's the uh, managing partner of Alternative Equity Advisors. He is the, uh, the AEA, as we call it, is the investment management platform that we have managing portfolios of farmland for investors. We also have Steve Brewer. Steve Brewer is the, the president of People's Company and uh, the principal owner and has been in that role since 2003. Both Dave and Steve are, uh, as they'll say in their own words, Iowa farm boys. They grew up on farms, their family have farms. And I believe Steve, uh, Dave, even for fun on weekends, goes out and still farms his own farm. So they're very active and knowledgeable around farmland. So hopefully you'll get a chance to know them a little better in the coming time that we get to uh, present you with information about uh, farmland. Um, last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Bruce Sherrick. Bruce Sherrick is a strategic advisor to People's Company. He is a uh, professor, the leading professor of, of farmland economics at the University of Illinois and also the director of the TIAA um, Center for Farmland Research at the university. So by many measures, probably the leading expert on farmland as an ex as an investment asset class and those at inside and out. So we thought no better than to have a, an objective expert present to you the uh, characteristics of farmland as an investment. So um, without further ado, let me turn it over to Bruce and uh, myself, Dave and Steve are here for questions too as we get, get through this. So. Thanks, Mark. Yep, okay. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Thanks for a little bit of time here. We'll go really, really rapidly through a super high level overview of the asset class. But I think it's always a shock to people who haven't been in the space to kind of see some of the data. And we just wanted to give it to you to give a bit of a, a kind of a scale and a, a scope of what's going on. I'm going to share a screen <clears throat> that has a little bit of data on it and ask, can thumbs up? Can you guys see it? Okay. Shared screen. Okay. So a lot of folks are kind of curious about the size of the asset class. It's about a $3 trillion, uh, with a T, $3 trillion asset class, heavily concentrated on the real asset side within that category, about 83 to 85%, depending on what point in time you measure it, of the asset class is what you would think of as real hard assets. <clears throat> What's up here is just decade at a time from left to right till you get to the vertical line and then three recent you know, two-year periods. The asset class has literally exploded in value, largely increasing with inflation. And then after inflation as a kind of a production asset, highly correlated with some other characteristics I'll show you in just a second. But kind of look down at the bottom right, the telling characteristic is there's only 14% debt in the sector. And as the kind of um, you know cost of capital has come in over the last couple of years, 
uh, the interest in getting access to something that you can put rational leverage in and you know ex get the, the expanded uh, payment for future income it's kind of come off the chart um, I think Mark gave an introduction uh, for my kind of academic role the other thing I do is I'm on some um, I'm on a board of one of the secondary markets so I'm pretty uh, pretty used to securitization and farmer Mac is the one specifically and we have like 21 22 billion a balance sheet with the idea of taking in farm, first mortgages, pulling them and figuring out how to make money on the kind of uh, realignment of credit risks. So this is kind of down the middle of the fairway of what I hear being described here, but just the, the amount of interest and the scale of the asset class, I think is you know, pretty impressive and sometimes hard for people to you know get their minds around if they didn't kind of grow up in that sector. Just a visual of this, the same thing we've had from 2008 forward during the financial crisis when a kind of short-term rates really came in, you had an acceleration of the um, kind of capital gains, if you will, or the growth in the asset class, but the debt never kept up. The debt simply stayed at a very low level. This is, a, this is the chart that I'll kind of um, focus on and kind of, kind of end on a little bit in terms of, of you know, high-level content and just have a couple of the pictures. This is organized with a collection of assets down the left-hand side. I keep track of about 80 different categories, but for today I picked some indicators of agriculture. You know, the 32 states in the US that have meaningful uh, agricultural production, then Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, kind of the center of the people's footprint in terms of row crop, then some equity categories, the ETH, S&P and NASDAQ, then some fixed income, 10-year treasury, high-grade bonds and barely investment grade down to, I guess I put BA, BAA on this one, 30-year, 20-year gold, and then inflation. And what's important to recognize is that if you look at the annual rate of return, this is a reasonably long period. It's not a you know cherry-picked period by any means, except that we have annual returns for farmland, so we can't include all of 2020 yet. I've gone through fourth quarter, I've gone through the end of third quarter, and there's no change in this. We just like to do whole years here for agriculture. Um, again, uh, pretty high returns, frankly, for an asset class that has such low standard deviation of returns. The CVs you'll see there are kind of like we all know for real estate, it's much higher generally, but for farmland, it turns out to be incredibly low. And then the minimum return and maximum returns from the last two columns, this is critical because you have this fixed coupon payment with ag, the, the rental income, and ag is about the only category that has 100% occupancy rate. You just, you, the price of the, you know, think of it as a hotel where you always get to sell every room and all you have to do is change the price a little bit every night. Um, but the drawdowns, um, I think for the equities are what's most astounding. And then the correlation is with respect to ag. What you see that is attractive to investors right now is that the uh, farmland has a negative or low correlation with equities in general and a high or positive correlation with fixed income and inflation in particular. So again, I know, Mark, you wanted me to give a super fast flyby on the asset class. A couple of other uh, just real quick pictures here. This one's always fun. You know, how did it do with your time and do you see any gaps in the earnings? And there's not. The, the, the asset class is really hard to get access to though. Uh, just it's a very slow to turn over asset class and you need some kind of boots on the ground to see the transactions because only one and a half to 2% of the assets sell per year. So you have to have kind of a acquisition network that's a little different than something where you could easily access within a single area, all the transactions. This is again, just a visual on the up and down. And then I think the last one to show is just if you think about the length of holding period, the roll length really matters with this particular asset. It's not the case with equities per se, but it really matters with ag returns in that the smoothness, if you will, if you think about the statistical properties, it's a, a the, the rate at which you get an estimable measure of variability is very short. You, you have very stable returns through time. And so they, they work through time as well as within the year. Um, Mark, Steve, Dave, anything else you want me to directly comment on before kind of turn it back over to kind of a question point. Yeah, I was thinking maybe some comments about uh, lease yields because our primary you know, strategy with farmland is to lease it out to farm operators. I don't know if you have some slides on that, Bruce, but um, um, maybe 
comments about leasing and the market and the economics behind that? Yeah, it's easier to probably just give the, the high level quick on that one. Um, <clears throat> about 60% of the land is leased to, a, to an operator that is not the owner. And then owners have about 40% of the land they farm in their own portfolio. And that creates a bit of a buffer for payment of lease returns. But leases are incredibly stable and they don't move year to year with farm income. It, again, it, it shocks people that corn prices can go down and it doesn't mean much to a farmer's income because prices go down when you grow a lot and they go up when you don't grow as much. So there's a natural hedge there. And then they're always looking forward because you can't, you can't shift the amount of acreage year to year and keep your equipment base employed. So in total, since all the acres get farmed, it's kind of a rearrangement of you know, where the, the tractors and combines uh, live but it's been an, an absolutely shockingly stable. I guess I do have one I can go forward to. If you were to look at it this way, the rent to value, um, uh, it's, it's kind of mimicked or exceeded something like, I always think of the 10 year uh, CMT to which I add a term premium and a credit risk premium. And then you can you know, kind of talk about any asset class with indexing. The, the rent to value ratios have been shockingly stable, but have stayed above uh, the didn't follow the cap rate all the way down, which creates a huge opportunity because there's kind of room to run if rates go back up. The bottom slide, again, I know I'm going through this super fast, but just as a you know starting point for a longer conversation, if the bottom right graph here is just if you were to say how much should you pay for the asset if you just capitalize the income, you know, agnostic to type of income, and it turns out the the asset values didn't. Uh, didn't get uh, trapped in the multiple expansion that some of the equities did. There's still room to run if, if rates go back up. So I don't know, is that so what you want to mark? Or? Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, the you know, key takeaways, you know, very stable uh, lease rates, um, relatively you know, low in the absolute sense, but um, premiums to treasuries and to other risk-free rates out in the market today. So very well, very good alternative for that. Um, also, want to make you know make a couple of comments about uh, you know our our, uh, our ability to lease the farms as I mentioned before is is fairly strong given our network of farmers and farming partners that we work with across the states. Uh, we'll also be in the heart of the courtland, uh, heart of the corn belt, uh, where there are lots of farmer options and lots of you know, farmers always looking for farmland to lease. So it's a you know that's that's primarily we'll be acquiring uh, uh, farmland with this. Another part about our strategy too, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, suggest is that um, as you might could, and hopefully could tell from my introduction about People's Company, we see a lot of farmland transactions, a lot of assets. So we can recognize value pretty readily. We can recognize assets that maybe are underpriced, recognize assets that could um, uh, improve in value with simple capital improvements or better conservation, better sustainable farm practices. And so we look for those kinds of opportunities and that's the kind of opportunities we use vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the maker uh, credit line. And uh, which means that we'd be hopefully, ideal, we accomplish our goals buying, buying farms at good values, maybe discounted values with some upside there alongside just the stable nature, low volatility uh, characteristics of the asset class to, as fundamentally to begin with. So, you know, I think lots of, lots of downside, uh, upside potential and downside protection vis-a-vis -vis the, the principal amount. And uh, from a leasing perspective, um, buying at those better values, making improvements, um, maybe having farms leased to organic uh, farm operators, we can uh, achieve better lease yields than what the market's, you know, typical average might be. Um, so that's part of our strategy and, and uh, that we can, that we can uh, employ as well. So just those few comments. Um, I don't know, Steve or Dave, if you had anything else you would like to suggest for the crowd that we've left, left off. Um, I'm just chiming in here, um, okay. looking at the time, um, okay. but maybe it would actually make sense for, um, maybe you can coordinate with one um, after the community green light to then have like a full on collateral onboarding call just with um, people's company. I think that makes sense. Um, and Agreed. if that's okay, I would probably um, hand over now to Nick from Fortuna Five. If there are any questions, maybe we can also gather them here in in the chat, and we'll make sure that we get back to everyone. Um, but then, 
turn over to Nick, if that's fine. Thank you. Great. Hey, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Nick. First, I must say hello to Bruce. I'm extremely uh, impressed and surprised to see you here. He used to be my professor at University of Illinois, so love to see that. Uh, life comes full circle sometimes. It's just incredible. It, uh, the world only shrinks. The world only shrinks. It's good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Nick, and uh, I'm the CEO of Fortunify. I'm going to do a presentation here so you guys can, can see some visuals. Um, again, want this to be sort of a open type of forum, so feel free to jump in with any questions. Great, so we are Fortunify. Uh, Fortunify was founded by myself and my partner, Jason. Uh, we're also uh, co-founders and general partners at a cryptocurrency hedge fund called Space Wheel Capital. Uh, we launched that back in 2018, and uh, we started investing in crypto back in 2013. Uh, privately and individually, and then eventually uh, launched this fund in 2018. Um, we incubated Fortunify within Space Whale um, because we saw a tremendous opportunity to bring institutional real world yield into DeFi. Um, we have been involved with Maker, not as much on the community side, but uh, more on the market side for quite a while now. We've been uh, using the product, trading the product, um, back since 2017. So extremely impressed to see, you know, not only the rollout to additional collateral within crypto, but now looking outside of crypto to a significantly bigger uh, market cap potential, which I think is ultimately phenomenal for uh, Maker in general. Uh, we've also invested, you know, across the board in other DeFi projects and have been fairly involved. So we're, we're very bullish on DeFi overall. Um, hence, you know, uh, me actually breaking off to start this, this new company that we find a tremendous amount of opportunity in. So just again, our vision is to bring institutional yield products to DeFi by rebuilding the securitization stack from the ground up. We have decided to go with revenue-based financing assets as the first asset we want to bring into DeFi. Um, we did a lot of work on this and ultimately settled on revenue-based financing assets because of their risk and return profile. Um, when you compare it against the capital stack, you know, from government debt as the lowest risk and lowest return all the way up to crypto, uh, being the highest risk and right now the highest return, not always the highest return, but you know, over a long period, it's been a phenomenal investment across the board. Uh, but then you look at revenue-based financing assets. It has a similar risk profile to senior debt. It's the first money out in a liquidation. It has seniority over any other capital in the company. Uh, and it has a return profile, almost like an equity-like product. Um, so we thought this would be a great product to bring in to DeFi. Uh, it's a very large growing market uh, that started about five to 10 years ago, I would say. Um, and it's been incredible to see it grow and bloom. Uh, we're big fans. So a little bit more on revenue sharing finance, uh, revenue-based finance. Um, think about it as a percentage of the cash flows that a company generates on a monthly basis. So we fund the company in return for a fixed percentage of their grossly month revenue. So it's a variable return. Uh, but we use uh, algorithms through our asset originator that we've partnered with, which I'll go into in a little bit, to price these assets um, and put the offer together. Um, there is a risk uh, score that we calculate on every underlying asset and only assets above a certain risk score are considered for investments in this pool. Um, typically, it's about one to 10% of the monthly revenue of a company. It's usually in the three to 4% range. Um, and the companies have an option to buy out this asset for typically one to three X of the principal of the asset. Um, you know, so a lot of companies, they use this in between funding rounds to not get diluted. They use this while their revenue is growing um, to finance growth that way, rather than further diluting themselves on equity. Um, happy to answer any questions here, but have a little more context here to give on these assets. Um, so there's 850 billion funding deficit for startups and small businesses in North America that is currently not being met at all by angels or venture capital or alternative lending or traditional markets. Um, we've partnered with a fintech originator called Coral. They specifically focus on these type of assets. Um, and they identified this back in 2016 and started building an incredibly technology platform to both originate and underwrite the risk of these assets. Um, 
you can also see over the last, uh, I would say about five years, there's been a pretty big surge in other venture-backed fintech originators that are working in the space, uh, including Pipe, Uncapped, Lighter Capital, and Bootstrap. Um, there's several others, but it's, it's, it's quite a growing market. You can see the chart here on the right back in 2010, there was virtually uh, zero of these deals going on. Uh, these companies simply just did not have access to funding. Um, and you see now in 2018, this chart only goes to 2018, but uh, the market has grown substantially and it's going to continue to grow with the emergence of these asset originators and uh, more capital coming into the market. One of the problems with new asset classes that are growing is the capital markets infrastructure is just simply not uh, up to speed there, right? Good luck getting you know, a, a warehouse facility for a revenue-based financing asset originator. Uh, there might be very few, but it'll typically super high interest rates. Uh, it'll be with a fund, not a bank, um, and it's just typically inefficient. Um, and we think that by bringing this into DeFi and partnering with Maker, uh, there are significant efficiencies both for the, the borrower, for the asset originator, and for ourselves. So a little bit of information on Coral, um, whom I mentioned we decided to partner with for this first pool. So they were founded in 2016, um, and they do provide capital to these small and, and growing businesses. Um, so a borrower would sort of come online to their platform, they would submit an application, uh, they connect to the platform via API. So if you have your accounting system, your um, Salesforce integration, your Google Analytics, um, they take about 10,000 different data points through API that a business typically has. Uh, and they bring it into their system called CRIIS, which is their algorithm that calculates a score for each individual underlying asset. Um, so they, they perform a quantitative assessment uh, and then uh, uh, results that come over a certain score are brought to investment committee, which uh, is inclusive of both Coral and ourselves. We make a decision on every asset and then we, we fund it and we bring it into the pool. Coral continues to service these assets on a monthly basis. They continue to bring in updated information on a monthly basis to recalculate the score of all the underlying assets. So we know in advance um, how the assets are performing, how the pool is performing and can correct anything before it gets out of whack. We have a tremendous amount of analytics. One of the reasons we actually decided to partner with Coral was because their technology and analytics platform is uh, substantially better than anyone else in the market that we have seen. Um, on this slide, which I think will circulate later, there's a link to a, a, a demo that we did for the Centrifuge community um, where I brought in the CEO of Coral and he did a demo through the platform. And I think it'd be really helpful for you guys to visualize that. If we had a little bit more time today, I would have brought him in as well to do another one, but uh, it looks like we can schedule another another call to go into more detail, but you guys are welcome to click the link here and, and see, see it for yourself. Um, so in 2020, Coral launched a $1 million proof of concept portfolio. Um, this is before we met them in, in the beginning of the year to demonstrate that their technology is working and they can originate. Um, it worked tremendously well. Um, you can see here on the right, they had an IRR of 56% actually on this portfolio. Um, these assets tend to perform very well um, and so to continue on the success of the proof of concept portfolio, we decided to partner with Coral and increase their access to capital um, and fund a larger pool. So we're starting with a million dollar pool uh, and we plan to scale it to 10 to 20 million next year. They have a tremendous pent up demand for these assets. Uh, sorry, they have a tremendous pent up demand um, from their clients. Uh, and so we think we can substantially scale this pool uh, with Coral and um, we do plan to spin up additional tools in the future with other asset originators, uh, both within the revenue-based financing space and uh, in other asset classes. Uh, generally looking to bring super high quality assets with strong yield and cash flows uh, into the DeFi community. Uh, so as Leah said, we're, we're planning on submitting our MIP6 uh, and entering the January governance cycle um, and hope to spend more time to answer any questions you guys have. Um, there's also a link on this slide that uh, to an underwriting report, we did a pretty in-depth underwriting report on our asset origination partner, Coral. Um, so you can see a lot more information, their history, the team, uh, their portfolio performance, uh, and, and more details around the asset and their technology. So I would encourage all of you to you know, take a look at that report. Um, but that is all I have for today. I uh, wanted to keep it short, uh, but happy to take any questions. Hey Nick, does, does, does this, um, the type of company, um, the profile of the company that you try to fund is it mostly um, high recurring revenue type companies? Correct. They're, they're typically, Plus, they're typically, revenue. correct. They're typically SaaS based revenue companies or e-commerce companies. Um, and, you know, 
there's a, a tremendous, there's a ton of metrics they need to pass to even qualify for investment. They need to have cert, over a certain amount of revenue per month. They need to have a certain amount of operating history. Uh, and, and the risk score needs to come above a certain level, which is based on their financials and their assets and liabilities. And so we look at everything before we make an investment decision. Okay, sorry, it's Phil. Um, how do you how do you define the the sell off price, the one to three x? So the algorithm automatically calculates the offer for each underlying asset based on the risk score and based on their cash flows and growing revenue. Um, typically, it ends up being around one point five x on the buyout, uh, but that will shift based on our target IRR, based on the profile of the company. Um, but it should be in the 1.5 range. It can be higher sometimes. It's higher because of higher risk? No, uh, because you know we might take a smaller percentage of the monthly revenue. Um, it's sort of a math that comes out to a certain target IRR that we're looking for on each underlying asset. Okay, got it, thank you. I mean, I have a, a ton of questions, uh, Nick, but I'm, I'm not sure we have the time to cover them all, uh, mainly based on, on risk and, and how this, this would work, the, the cash flows and, and all that. Yeah. So maybe it will be, it's very worth it to have you guys back uh, in January uh, to discuss it more in depth. Yeah, would love to. I can bring uh, our partner from Coral, um, who's been you know, focused on this asset class for the last five years and has a tremendous amount of experience uh, in both securitizations and lending. Uh, so we can bring them on and we can answer all of your questions. Uh, you can also reach out via email and I'm happy to answer any questions ahead of time. Great. Now I want to be mindful of people's times. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, I don't know, people have dinner or dates to attend. Um, so so yeah, let's keep the conversation going in the forum. I think your all your names are there. So yeah, questions Absolutely. are very welcome. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know, Seb, if you wanted to, to mention something before closing. Uh, I want to mention that uh, we will work on uh, those three collaterals uh, starting in January. Well, we have started for some already. Uh, and maybe the first uh, batch of collaterals may took some time to incorporate in Maker, but the next one can come really quickly. Uh, maybe end of February, who knows? So expect things yeah, to, to move uh, quicker. Sounds good. Uh, so yeah, thanks again to the well, Harbor Trade, um, Fortunafy, and People's Company. It was great having you guys. And um, let's keep the discussion going in the forums. And see you guys next year. Have great holidays. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good. Happy New Year's.